Hello friends, thank you for joining me on the next video of our discussion on the Shankari Prasad case. We have looked at the background for the First Amendment and then I have ranted about why that amendment should not have ever happened. Now let's take a look at what the Supreme Court actually had to say about the amendment on the 5th of October 1951. We have looked at the facts, uh, the lead up to the First Amendment and indeed to the Shankari Prasad case. First of all, the land reform legislation that was held void by the Patna High Court, the reservations that were held unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in the Champakam Dorarajan case, and the freedom of speech held to be unrestricted as far as public order etc. was concerned by the Supreme Court and several High Courts. I'm talking about Ramesh Thapar and Bridge Bhushan and then the various High Court decisions most notably the Shaila Baladevi case in Patna again. The government's response to all of these uh, setbacks was to amend the constitution, to remove those uh, perceived hindrances to the, uh, to the execution, to the implementation of the government's uh, policy, of its welfare policy, which included reservations as well as land reforms and to uh, shield itself from criticism in the media. The uh, amendment was challenged pretty much immediately by the zamindars, by the ones who were at the receiving end of the sanctions of the First Amendment. They approached the Supreme Court under Article 32 because the right to property, which was a fundamental right back then, was being abridged by this amendment. So that is the uh, lead up to how this uh, matter ended up in the Supreme Court directly, of course, because of Article 32. The five judge bench which heard uh, this case, led by Chief Justice Kanya and Justices Patanjali Shastri, B.K. Mukherjee, Sudhiranjan Das, and N. Chandrasekhar Iyer, have put, in, put a star against Justice Patanjali Shastri because he was the one who wrote the opinion of the court in this particular matter. The arguments made before the court, I am going to restrict uh, the discussion to only these four arguments. There were a couple of more that were also made, but they were even more formalistic than the ones that we are going to discuss. So those amendments were not really uh, necessary as far as our discussion is concerned. So I am going to restrict myself to these four. The first being that uh, the Zamindas argued that the provisional parliament was not competent to amend the constitution. The constitution can be amended by the parliament, uh, but this parliament which had amended, uh, which had sent through the first amendment was only a provisional parliament. Its members were not elected by the people. The second argument was that uh, a constitutional amendment needs to be approved by each of the two houses of parliament. The provisional parliament on the other hand of course was a unicameral one, just the constituent assembly sitting as the parliament. So if the amendment was approved by only one house, can it have been said to have been approved at all? The third amendment was that the constitutional amendment was violating or abridging or interfering or infringing a fundamental right, the right to property. Can a law which uh, does this, can a law be held valid if it does so? The question basically being, is a constitutional amendment a law as defined in uh, Article 13 of the Constitution? And finally, the fourth argument, these two new articles, 31b and 31b, uh, they were curtailing the powers of the judiciary and if the judiciary's powers were to be modified, then the constitution requires such an amendment to be ratified by at least half the states, half the state legislatures have to approve this amendment, which was not done in the case of the first amendment. So let's look at each of these arguments in succession, starting with the contention that the provisional parliament was not competent to amend the constitution. This uh, argument relied on a pretty formalistic measure that the parliamentarians who amended the constitution were not actually elected by the people. They were just the members of the constituent assembly. So that argument is 
is a pretty weak one because after all the constituent assembly wrote the constitution so how can we say that they did not have the power to amend it not just that secondly there existed article 379 within the constitution uh, a temporary provision which now has been repealed which says that until both houses of parliament have been duly constituted and summoned the body functioning as the constituent assembly immediately before the commencement of this constitution shall be the provisional parliament and shall exercise all the powers and perform all the duties conferred by the provisions of this constitution on parliament very straightforward very clear very concise and no room for any doubt left by clause 1 of article 379 until both houses of parliaments have been constituted the constituent assembly shall be the provisional parliament and shall exercise all the powers conferred by the constitution so that takes care of that first argument uh, pretty easily the next argument was about each of the two houses uh, article 368 which uh, talks about the amendment powers and procedure in the constitution an amendment of this constitution may be initiated only by the introduction of a bill for the purpose in either house of parliament and when the bill is passed in each house by a majority of the total membership of that house and by a majority of not less than 2/3 of the members of that house present and voting it shall be presented to the president for his assent and upon such assent the constitution shall stand amended so these uh, phrases either house and each house and that house implied that two houses need to be in place but of course there was only one house at that time because elections had not been held parliament had not been duly constituted it was the constituent assembly sitting as the parliament but this constituent assembly had in its prescience also added this article article 392 another temporary provision power of the president to remove difficulties the president may for the purpose of removing any difficulties to the provisions of this constitution by order direct that this constitution shall during such period as may be specified in the order have effect subject to such adaptations whether by way of modification addition or omission as he may deem to be necessary article 392 in short empowered the president to modify anything in the constitution that was uh, creating difficulties for the uh, implementation of the constitution and such orders had been uh, issued by the president several times uh, we are specifically going to speak about uh, constitution removal of difficulties order number 2 of 1950 this order has not been pasted in the uh, judgment but it is available on the uh, website of the legislative department of the government of india and uh, here we are the constitution removal of difficulties order number 2 which um, specified that the constitution shall have effect subject to the adaptations directed to be made in this schedule that came along with the order so it's quite a lengthy order plenty of items in the schedule the ones important for us are over right over here article 368 is adapted to omit either house of and in each house and for that house substitute parliament i have noted these changes over here it basically says that in article 30, 368 the phrase either house of and the phrase in each house shall be omitted and for the phrase that house parliament should be substituted so there we go an amendment of this constitution may be initiated only by the introduction of a bill for the purpose in parliament and when the bill is passed by a majority of the total membership of parliament and so on and so forth so this removal of difficulties order negates this second argument as well that the constitutional amendment should be approved by each of the two houses of parliament but there was a presidential order in place which uh, ensured that that particular formality was not required which brings us to the next two arguments made from the side of the zamindars uh, 
that the constitutional amendment is a law as defined by Article 13 and the First Amendment violates Article 13 because it abridges the right to property and so although it is a constitutional amendment, it is void. So let us first take a look at Article 13 uh, which talks about over here the state shall not make any law which takes away or abridges the rights conferred by this part, part 3 that is fundamental rights and any law made in contravention of this clause shall to the extent of the contravention be void and clause 3 of article 13 talks about what all is included in law in this article unless the context otherwise requires law includes any ordinance, order, bylaw, rule, regulation, notification, custom or usage having in the territory of India the force of law. It does not specify constitutional amendment, do note that, but it is an inclusive definition, not an exhaustive one, which means that the court could have interpreted this in a wider sense, giving a wider interpretation would have allowed the court to hold that a constitutional amendment is indeed a law, but the Supreme Court had a different opinion. According to the court, the fundamental rights are indeed immune from interference by laws, but those are laws made by the state and not from constitutional amendment. Article 13 clause 2 provides protection from the invasion of fundamental rights by the legislative and executive organs of the state by means of laws and rules made in exercise of their legislative power and not the abridgment or nullification of such rights by alterations of the constitution itself in the exercise of the sovereign constituent power. Justice Patanjali Shastri is basically saying that yes, a law cannot abridge a fundamental right and uh, such abridgment, such invasion is protected by Article 13 Clause 2. But over here, the uh, makers of the constitution intended to protect the fundamental rights from the legislative and executive organs of the state by the means of laws and rules made in the exercise of their legislative power or their executive power. It did not protect the constitution, it did not protect the fundamental rights from being abridged or nullified by the alteration in the constitution itself. When the constitution is being amended, Parliament is sitting as the Constituent Assembly and it is exercising its sovereign constituent power and not its legislative or executive power and therefore the fundamental rights are not immune from amendment, a constitutional amendment which, um, which nullifies or abridges fundamental rights cannot be held ultra virus for that reason. Which finally brings us to the Fourth Amendment where the uh, curtailment of the powers of the judiciary were, was contended by the side of the Zamindars. The Zamindars basically claimed that Articles 31a and 31b uh, which were uh, inserted by the First Amendment, these were taking away the power of the High Courts and the Supreme Court to uh, to basically review any of the enactments that were abridging the fundamental right to property. And this was violative of Article 368 because Article 368 calls for the ratification of a constitutional amendment by not less than half the state legislatures. Uh, the state legislatures have to approve a resolution, have to pass a resolution which approves any amendment which makes certain changes to the constitution and that list of changes includes these two bullet points chapter 4 of part 5 of the constitution which is the union judiciary and chapter 5 of part 6 of the constitution which is entitled the high courts in the states but the uh, supreme court once again as we have seen in the A.K. Gopalan case as well as in Champakam Dorai Rajan as well as Ramesh Thapar and Bridge Bhushan, in all of those cases we have seen that the Supreme Court was in its early years very keen on uh, making a literal interpretation of the uh, 
words in the constitution of the letter of the law and was not prepared to give a wider spirit of the law kind of interpretation to the constitution and the words of the constitution in article 368 said that ratification is required only when chapter 4 of part 5 is amended only when chapter 5 of part 6 is amend amended it does not say when the powers of the judiciary are uh, reduced or modified it only talks about these particular specific chapters which indeed had not been modified by the first amendment secondly the amendment did not make any changes to the jurisdiction of the higher judiciary as per the supreme court article 132 which talks about the appellate jurisdiction of the supreme court article 136 which talks about the uh, special leave uh, petitions to the supreme court and article 226 which is the writ jurisdiction of the high courts none of these had been changed what the amendment had sought to do was to merely exclude a certain class of cases from the purview of part 3 of the constitution part 3 was only being modified and part 3 is not in that list of, uh, of provisions if amended that require ratification by at least half the states so even though this amendment was not ratified by half the states half or more that did not make it invalid because the supreme court interpreted that the powers of the judiciary had not been curtailed at all it was part three whose purview was uh, excluded from a certain class of cases so the verdict was a 5-0 uh, thrashing one might say of the petition filed by shri shankari prasad singh dev against the union of india and the state of bihar so that concludes this uh, rather short discussion uh, but we will return to this case we will keep on referring to it later in the history of the supreme court because as the journey progressed it became clear to the judges of the supreme court that the court uh, the constitution had been uh, really negated by this particular amendment and they were going to treat such uh, inroads into the constitution and in the powers of the judiciary much more seriously in the future but as it stood on the 5th of October 1951, the First Amendment was upheld by the Supreme Court of India. Thanks for joining me. See you again for another discussion next time.